Hello, welcome to the Friday, February 16th, 2018 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Yesterday I mentioned a vulnerability in the Skype update process and how it was possible to execute code as system by abusing the Skype updater. Well, it turns out this particular problem actually has been fixed by Microsoft in October. If you're running Skype for Windows version 8 or later, then you do not have this problem. It's only affecting versions 7.4 and lower. And then again, version 8 was released in October last year. And getting Unicode right is really not easy. I tried it on the Internet Storm Center website, but for example, some users noticed you can still not really use foreign characters, for example, in your username, because yeah, it's not easy to validate and display Unicode characters correctly. iOS apparently is having a real difficult time with that as well. I guess that makes me feel better not getting it right. But with iOS, the problem tends to be denial of service attacks using Messenger. Now, the latest set of characters are two Indian characters. If you receive them in various iOS programs, like for example, Messenger, WhatsApp, Facebook Messengers, or even Outlook, Gmail, and Twitter, then iOS will essentially just crash. So it's only a denial of service vulnerability. It's not a remote code execution vulnerability, but still something that can be rather annoying in particular since uh, these characters are now out in the open and well known. Apparently iOS has it fixed in the up and coming version of iOS 11.3. The beta version is not vulnerable uh, to this. There are also some reports that Mac OS is vulnerable to this particular problem. Now, the next version of iOS uh, that will fix this is sort of scheduled to be released in April. It's very possible, sort of based on experience with similar bugs in the past, that Apple will actually release sort of a bug fix release sooner than that. And we've all seen many, many Word documents with macros that are then used to run exploits. And of course, because this is such a common and in some ways also devastating exploit technique, a lot of uh, organizations are either outright blocking Word documents with macros or at least uh, disable macros in Word and also teach their users not to enable them. So attackers have to come up with new ways to execute code. Trustwave came across an interesting piece of malware that sort of found a way around all of these protections. Now, just like the traditional exploits, it starts out with a Word document. But within the Word document, there is a second document, an RTF document that's embedded. Now, this is where it starts to get tricky. This RTF document now uses the equation editor vulnerability to actually load an HTA document. So we're at the third document here. And of course, this assumes that you not yet have patched this latest equation editor vulnerability from late last year. HTA documents are really HTML files and HTML files, they can contain scripts. And in the case of HTA files, uh, they're then being executed by the Windows HTML application host or mshta.exe. So the trick here is really to sort of work your way to a document type that is no longer affected by the sort of global restrictions on macros and then execute the macros once you're in the HTA document. And that of course should not be blocked. This particular version of course is easily averted if you just patch the equation editor vulnerability. But of course, it's just a matter of time for people to come up with other vulnerabilities to essentially accomplish the same thing. And who knows, never underestimate the creativity of an attacker. Maybe they'll be able to figure it out without any real exploit. 
But who needs exploits if all you need is a simple phishing attack and some Google ads? Blockchain.info apparently was the target of a number of phishing attacks where the attacker actually didn't send any emails. Instead, they just purchased Google ads in order to trick users to the malicious sites. They used sort of lookalike typos for blockchain.info in order to trick the users. And then of course they stole their credentials and with that they did steal their crypto coins. Based on DNS query data, some of these typo domains, they did receive in the order of 100 to 200 thousand DNS requests per hour, which sort of lets you extrapolate that the number of affected users was probably quite significant. Another sort of unusual thing about this particular attack was that apparently the victims were predominantly from African country with Nigeria making up 46% of the victims according to Talos again. Now this may be due to cryptocurrencies being a little bit more popular in those countries due to some bad banking systems, but it could also be that non-native English speakers are more likely going to fall for these type of typo domains. Well, this is it again for today. And just a reminder, this podcast is actually available via a wide range of channels. Alexa, for example, you can add it as one of your possible flash news items. And well, thanks for listening and talk to you again on Monday. Bye.